Welcome to our weekly compilation, where we gather all the fascinating stories you may have overlooked. If you're in search of captivating and satisfying stories, you've come to the right place. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to stay tuned for the latest gossip from all corners of the web. Leave a comment with the timestamps of your favorite stories, and let's dive in. What's your, we will never speak of this again moment? Story 1. I have two sets of cousins that we really have those moments with. I usually vlog some of these moments and share it only with them. Anyway, one set we go on vacation with every year, and the other we go visit their house every few months for family gatherings. First story is first set. Me and the boys, we were in high school. I was a freshman. One was a sophomore, and the third homie was a junior. We went up to a resort in the Wisconsin Dells and basically messed around in the third homie's room when we weren't busy. We had late night talks about life that we don't talk about outside our conversations with each other and the group chat. Nothing we can't share, but everything we don't share. The deep talks about life. Well, the last night we were at the resort before heading home, the third homie grabbed three balloons, one for each of us. It was 11.36 p.m. CST. And next thing we know, we're squeaking balloons as loud as we can while people in rooms around us were getting out of their beds and probably filing room complaints. We had a blast that night, popped balloons and scared people, and somehow didn't get kicked out. Well, as for the second set of cousins, it was the weekend of my birthday. My oldest cousin's boyfriend took me and my cousin, my age, to Walmart to mess around. We messed around with the unlocked phones, you know, being dumb teenagers. We were being dumb and having fun. When we got back to the house, we played ghosts in the graveyard for a few hours straight. And my uncle is absolutely terrifying when he plays. After the ghosts in the graveyard game, we found a lighter in the garage and proceeded to light random stuff on fire. It started with leaves and sticks. And then me and my cousins got curious. We then burnt a Walmart bag. And then we found an old Tickle Me Elmo toy, beat up and barely functioning. The thing looked like it had been run over. So our dumb horse teenager idiocy got the Elmo, took one last video of him laughing, but I kept it rolling. They didn't know that I filmed the entire time. I have the tape somewhere on a hard drive. We set Elmo on the driveway. It's two in the morning by now. My cousins couldn't forget to get the gasoline and douse Elmo with it. And then we got kitchen tongs to activate Elmo while he's burning, and then we did it. My cousin pressed his foot, and she quickly backed away while I lit his arm, and he went ablaze in less than a second. As Elmo began rolling on the ground, the fire spread rapidly, and the animatronic inside began to melt. I only had to reactivate him once, and as he was laughing, his laughing suddenly dropped to a deep, distorted laugh, and my cousins were terrified. My smart head knew that the plastic melting was messing with the circuit board, and Elmo didn't laugh much longer until he was completely gone. We then put Elmo out, and now he's in the ditch. We then went back inside, and I connected my phone to a giant Bluetooth speaker. I began blasting inside jokes within the family, certain sound effects and quotes from YouTube. One well-known, the giant horse conch weighs over 11 pounds. We then began blasting anything we could to get each other to laugh while waking everyone else in the house. We all ended up crashing in the living room at 6 a.m. that morning. We woke up at 2 p.m. and we then agreed that that was the night we kept to ourselves and don't mention to anything else. Not even in the group chat. I should try bringing up the night sometime to my cousins to see how they react. This one isn't really all that nefarious. Unless that Elmo belonged to someone that they knew that they were trying to hide it from or a younger sibling, it doesn't seem all that tragic. Picturing an animatronic Elmo on fire reminds me of that Helmo meme. Or of Elmo being the Dread Pirate Roberts in The Princess Bride. The Dread Pirate Elmo has come for your souls! Story 2 the spicy toy known as the wand was invented as an automatic potato masher. After nearly 150 years, it still has never changed its design. It grew out of fashion to use for potatoes because women used it for spicy time too many times and it got a bad reputation. They still would in fact be one of the best potato mashers you can use. 
It's just no one uses them for their actual intended purpose. Well, me and a friend years ago saw a package labeled for his sister, and his sister said she was expecting only one package that month. His sister ordered him an item for a video game because she owed him for doing her part of the house chores, so he was hoping to get the video game stuff. Instead, it was the wand. I was a weird nerd and the internet was new at the time, and I found out it was called a potato masher from looking at old technology. It worked great. She was ticked off that we used it for mashing potatoes, and their dad walked in to see us mashing potatoes with it, and asked where we got the potato masher, and said, well, thought it was the video game stuff, but it was this. My friend's dad thought it was funny we were using it for that, and showed us a catalog to order one in the mail from around the 1920s, and it was called a potato masher as well. Me, my friend, and his dad all knew it had two uses, but we used it for the not-disgusting reason. His sister did not want to admit it was the real reason she bought it. She wanted to throw it away, but her dad took it out of the trash and mocked her for it for a few months before hiding it in a shoebox under her bed for her to use. This one seems like the opposite of we'll never speak of this again. This is more like we will speak of this very often and as much as we possibly can to anyone we know. I'm sure the woman really wishes no one would speak of it. Did they at least wash the thing before they gave it back to her? Story 3. I remember back in high school, I was actually able to walk to my house during lunch because I lived so close. Me and my buddy would go in the shed in the backyard and get absolutely stoned every day. I remember coming out of the shed with a huge cloud of smoke flowing out, and my mom standing there after bringing some scraps to the chickens. I remember her saying one thing and one thing only. Not during school, and we never spoke of it again. She knew I was smoking weed for years and never said a thing. She was fine with it and probably expected it, considering my brothers all did the same thing. I'm sure glad she never told my dad. And goodness, that story about the horse video brought up a memory. I remember when I used to pick on this guy we knew back in school. We were in the computer lab and my friend went over to his computer while he was away. He pulled up a video of a horse plowing a woman. Back then, I don't think ad blocker was even a thing, but the kid got back and basically couldn't exit out of the site because of all the pop-up ads. They suspended him and actually made him start seeing the school counselor. We were some real bad kids for sure. I hope he's doing well these days. I made sure to apologize for all of the bullying we gave him. Okay, here's a proper we'll never speak of this again. And this one was actually a pretty positive one. I think it was great that the mom set some boundaries on this activity she knows was going to happen anyway. As long as they stuck to the agreement, I don't see a problem with it. Heck, they weren't even smoking inside the house and getting the smell in there. Everyone just being considerate all around. Story 4. A female friend of mine once called me crying. Her ex-boyfriend was being a jerkwad. For context, they were still sleeping together. I, being her usual shoulder to cry on, meet up with her to comfort her and all that. Then she tells me she doesn't want to go back to his apartment and hers is quite far, so we head back to my place. She had already mentioned previously that she has slept with guy friends platonically, as in cuddle buddies, and so we both got into bed and chatted until we were both sleepy. Nothing weird happened. Some hugs here and there before going to sleep. We both stayed on our side of the bed. I fall asleep, a few hours go by, and all of a sudden I feel someone grab me by the shoulder and then start kissing me passionately. I hold her face and do the same. We made out for a good ten seconds before she pulls away, gasps, and starts crying. Still half asleep, I ask her what's wrong, and she says, I'm sorry. I've been sleeping with him for so long I thought you were him. She left early in the morning and asked me to never mention it. Too long didn't read? A friend of mine mistook me for her ex, and we made out for ten seconds in the middle of the night. Story 5 Oh, When I was younger and figured out I was interested in BDSM, I started doing self-bondage. Started light and slowly got more into it. Well, one day I decided to do a bit of it and tied a rope around my elbows behind my back. 
Boy, howdy, did I pull them too tight because I got stuck. Like, for a while. I tried so hard to get out, used my environment, I could hardly move around since I decided to tie my legs together first. Trying to get just any kind of leverage on the rope that was slowly cutting off my circulation. Nothing worked, and I was getting kind of scared. The rope was not the kind you should use for bondage, and I was a dumb kid and didn't have a pair of scissors nearby to cut the rope with. My arms had gone numb, so I did the only thing I could do at this point. I called for help. Who was I living with at the time? My parents. I certainly remember the disappointment in her voice, but because she was behind me, I didn't have to see it on her face. Best believe we have never talked about it since. What science experiment would you try if money and ethics are not an issue? Story 1. I would like to create humans with traits from one or multiple animals, like the infamous cat girls or other monster animal girls, as they're called in most animes, to see if a. It's possible for them to have offspring of their own, and what genetic mutation may happen if they can reproduce, since if I remember correctly, during physical reproduction, sex cells traits, like hair, fur, scales, eye color, skin, and more, get swapped with the same genes of the same type. Think of it like a deck of cards making healthy sex cells. Well, most of the time. Eye color for eye color, for example. But for animals of different species, these genes are different, like eye color for hair color, making unhealthy sex cells, but very rarely this swapping is just skipped, leaving the offspring with only the mother's traits allowing them to reproduce. So I would like to see if they can reproduce not just with humans, but with ones of their own kind, two of the same animal traits. B. See how these traits affect their behavior and what they can and can't do. How these traits affect their daily life, like how being part bat may affect what time of day they're most active, or how being part spider or mantid may affect mating, like will they eat their mate after intimacy? Fun fact, female mantis and spider that eat their mate have offspring than those that don't. Or how being part chameleon will affect the way they show others their mood, which, extra fun fact, chameleons don't change color to blend in, but to tell other chameleons their mood, like if they're angry or sad and how these traits affect their diets. Finally, see how people just react to this. Like imagine one day you're told that a real-life monster or animal girl or humans as a whole exist, and at some point, they just become a part of everyday life on a train. There's a person with cat ears, tails, whiskers, and all other cat-like traits. Or at work, you're talking to your coworker and they have wolf-like traits like ears and a tail and all other wolf traits and many other examples. Or imagine being sent into the future, then people with some type of animal trait just exist and they're everywhere. What would your reaction be to either being told that humans with animal traits now exist and having to just live with it for the rest of your life and your kids' lives, if you have any kids, that is, or being sent into the future to see that these people do really exist in the future? Please tell me in the replies. Emperor Matthew signing off. This guy just wants cat girls to be real. With all the issues we're having with the gender and identity and everything these days, I don't know if introducing cat girls and wolf boys into the mix is really gonna calm things down for people. Even if they have positive traits or if they somehow have traits from their animal parts, that allow them something that would dominate over human species. You're gonna find, uh, interspecies racism, pretty much, I think. Story 2. I had an experiment in mind a long time ago. It would go against and with the school system now. Teach the first kid by prioritizing their favorite subject, then, and helping them grow that as far as they can until, one, they want to change their majoring subject, or two, get to the point where the knowledge I'm trying to teach them is virtually impossible for me to understand. Child 2 would be taught the public school's way, making them well-rounded and not give two cares if they're more interested in one subject to others. Child 3 would be taught in a way where they are encouraged to be curious while also having limited human interaction. They want to know what this and that feels like? Let them figure it out for themselves. Don't secure them from the outside world or the internet and let them learn their own way. Let them experiment if they want to. Let them explore. 
They'll learn sooner or later that some things may unalive them. Only supervise them when absolutely needed, and only when absolutely needed. Then let them all meet up and try to get along and figure out how each of them interact with each other and how they get along. If they can't get along, then guide the first child, help the second, and leave the third. If they get along, study how they interact and get a basic understanding of what they like and how well they get along, how often they fight, etc. While making sure to write down, record, do whatever you can to make sure every part of their life is documented. The school system then can't argue what worked the best. It might just change the most successful education system with some slight changes to be the most ethical they can. I really don't like the school system. Side note, this is the most effort I've put into writing or typing something in a while. I didn't put this much effort into my English essay. Ethically, this one's pretty tame. It's kind of like this guy wants to go Truman Show on three kids all over the education system. Isn't there some kind of alternative school system where they let kids learn at their own pace already? Is this guy actually a behavioral scientist in some way? Story 3. 1. Raise a pair of identical twins in the same family under the same conditions. As infants, one is only fed baby formula by the father, while the other is breastfed by the mother. I heard a rumor that children who weren't breastfed have less emotional attachment to their mother and become more rebellious as teens or adults. So I'd like to see how different the twins' personalities would be if no other differences were involved. 2. Take a fertilized human egg. Wait for it to split into two. The first goes back into the mother to develop into a human. The second is quickly genetically modified to never develop a brain further than the sections needed to regulate the heart and lungs. When the infant is fully developed and born, remove half of the brain from the natural child and implant it into the brainless skull of the artificial child. You now effectively have two children that share the same brain but only have one half of it. Is it possible for infants to have brain matter removed for medical reasons and they grow up normal and unaltered as a result? What I'd like to know is what would happen if that removed matter was allowed to develop itself? Would you just end up with effectively identical twins? Or would they in some way be one person in two bodies? 3. Take a young ant colony and place it into a miniature hot air balloon and send it up into the atmosphere or on a boat into the ocean, ideally with small ant-like robots designed to observe and assist the growing colony. It'd be neat to see how or if an ant colony could survive in an entirely alien environment ants have no business being in. For the balloon experiment, I know there's a layer of atmosphere where bugs and spiders float around to travel to new locations, so if we can keep the ants there, they might still be able to hunt in some form. Number two is bringing us into the mad scientist category there. Is this guy proposing that two people that have halves of the same brain are going to develop some kind of telepathy with themselves? Surely there's somebody that studied something similar. Maybe they've studied it with animals. Granted, you're not going to find that kind of results out in the open. Maybe if you had dug deep, you could probably find some sort of experiments like that that happened. Story 4. When it comes to genetics and advancing the human species, I've always thought that this is where cloning could come in handy. Obviously, not all clones should be used for this, but clones are, well, clones. They aren't the original. There are still ethics to worry about, but, like, imagine if we could clone people and then just experiment on the clones. All the discoveries we can make that we can't make right now because you can't just clone yourself or anyone else so you can do these tests on a double without ruining someone else's life. Figuring out anything we have left to figure out about the human body. Experiments to improve the human lifespan. Maybe even stop aging. Because I've seen a video where the person suggests aging might be a disease. Hell, remember the guy who said he wanted to give humans girls and create cat people? Just make a whole ton of clones of yourself and experiment away until you get the desired result or it just proves impossible. When you find a guaranteed method of achieving what you want, do it multiple times to make sure it's a 100% guaranteed success each time. Then take your findings to whoever you need to, and we can officially start implementing this stuff into actual humans with no worries about consequences because all the testing has already been done on clones. Before you know it, Humans have gills, and we have cat people as a new humanoid race on Earth living alongside us. Story 5. 
I'd be interested to see how different groups would react and adapt if they were kidnapped and placed in an inescapable environment. The environment would have shared areas, dining room, bathrooms, and a room with chairs, tables, and writing supplies, and one small bedroom per person. No connection to the outside world, and only artificial lighting. Always on for shared areas, switch controlled in bedrooms, and all food would be given out on demand by machines that are automatically refilled. And then, a bunch of different groups would be caught and put in there. Let's see how a group of friends, a small family, a group of people visiting a UFO conference, a group of people who don't speak the same language, a group of deaf people, a group of people who do the same job but don't know each other, a group of people with the same or very different political ideologies, a group of depressed people, etc., would react to this and how they interact with each other. Changing the interior design of the environment, clean minimalist, alien slash sci-fi, 1920s, etc., would also be interesting to see how that influences their theories regarding where they are. And introducing animals would be interesting to see if and how their behavior changes when they have a single cat or dog for the whole group, or like a fish tank in each room. Would that decrease overall stress? Or would the animal bonding differently with different people introduce more stress to the group? Men, what's your creepy woman story? Story 1. Basically, I had a yandere for a semi-girlfriend. She was overweight a bit, but in the sense that it just accentuated her features rather than obscured them. She had an obvious crush on me, but being the idiot that I was, and still am according to my friends, I had no idea. Anyway, she comes to me during an event and asks me to date her. I initially say no, because A, instant nerves, and B, she had a reputation for being kind of weird. She insists and says that anything I may have heard about her is untrue because it's all part of a smear campaign from her ex-boyfriend. Having gone through that pain myself, I relented and said yes, but not completely so that I can consider how romance works. I'm a nerd who literally has a harder time making friends than I do writing Dungeons & Dragons homebrew manuals. The next day, she witnesses me getting the hell beaten out of me by my third bully, according to my list of people who hate me. I had no idea she saw that, though, so I thought that when his windshield was smashed, a rock or tree hit it. Nope, it was her. She smashed his windshield to get him back for hurting those I love. Dude, I barely know you. Why would you commit a criminal act to protect someone you barely knew? I thought it was sweet, honestly, but I told her not to escalate it to that level again. She agrees, and we move on. Fast forward to a month later. We'd had a nice couple of weeks, casually being semi-romantic and hanging out. One day, she meets up with me, dragging along a bruised, beaten girl by the ripped shirt, and says in a Dolores Umbridge-like voice, This one was stalking you. Finish her off for me, would you? I stare, aghast. As a person who avoids confrontation like Karen's avoid wearing face masks, this was the last thing I wanted, besides intimacy. I say, no, and we're done. I cannot associate myself with abusive people anymore. I will not deal with any more of this. For context, my old friend group I had before meeting her was extremely toxic. They even teamed up to get the star high school football player sent to prison for substance charges by planting weed in his hubcaps, all for a single snide remark he made at school to the ringleader. I walk away, taking my hurting friend, whose future boyfriend held me at knife point in the bathroom at a party a few months later because I am a threat to his relationship into the building we met up at. I made sure she got treated and went home to hide from the inevitable payback I was sure to get. I dodged a bullet in that she was arrested for assault charges that I phoned in before she could have her revenge. She got out after I moved away with my family, so I still have yet to know if her behavior ever improved. I really hope she's not lurking in the shadows and somehow followed him to where he moved. It sounds like this is something this girl would do. Somehow, this type of violence is just far more creepy than the average girl blowing up at a boyfriend. There's crazy 
And then there's insane. Story two. I have many stories, but one I will share is when I was 16. I was kicked out of my parents' house. I was headstrong and angry at the world, and they had every right to do so. Anyhow, my friend's mom and dad let me stay with them, rent-free, just to get back on my feet and finish high school without the added stress of a job. They offered to let me stay for the next two years to do so. I had always had a crush on my friend's mom, whom I will call L. She was absolutely, breathtakingly beautiful, smart, funny, and fiercely strong. One day, I had a day off from school, and she was home with a day off too. We were sitting in her living room on opposite sides of the couch, talking about her days in high school, her dreams, mine, our lives, work, etc. And after a serious bout of laughter, she got up to pour herself a cup of coffee. When she came back, she sat down right beside me, put her hand on my thigh, looked me in the eyes and asked, Do you think I'm pretty? I blinked and said, Of course, you're beautiful. She moved her hand even higher on my thigh, almost at my pelvis at that point, and whispered, My husband hasn't touched me in three years. I'm so lonely. He makes me feel unwanted and unloved. Can you make me feel pretty, Chris? I stood up, cleared my throat, and told her I had to go do my homework and rushed off to my friend's room. When I came back downstairs ten minutes later, she was gone. I packed my duffel bag, walked out the door, and went to go live in the bush for a month until my folks dragged me home. I never spoke to her or my friend again. I'd have refused to lie if he asked why I suddenly moved out, and I didn't want to say anything about it to him. How do you tell your friend his mom's a pervert? The fantasy upon meeting reality was shattered, and it was creepy as hell. I was wigged right the hell out. Keep in mind, I was 16 and she was 44 years old. The spicy sights paint such a different picture about what they expect to happen here, don't they? I mean, I'm asking you. I wouldn't know personally. No, not at all. Not one bit. Anyway, good on this 16-year-old for having a head on his shoulders after thinking about what the consequences could be. Not many 16-year-olds would have that frame of mind. Story 3. When I was in middle school, my class had received a student teacher. She looked to be 20 or 21 and was pretty nice but very neutral on how she treated students. My best friend at the time and I were one of the few good students with most of the others just liking to act out. If I remember correctly, there were five students who actually behaved, including me and my friend, so it always felt odd that she notably treated me different from everyone else in the classroom. Even my friend found it weird when I pointed it out to him. She was always passive-aggressive toward my friend and the well-behaved students, but then slightly rude to the ones that did misbehave. However, when it came to me, she was always nice, sometimes a little too nice. One time, I remember I couldn't finish an assignment due to me forgetting about it, and she gave me time to finish in class, but when another student, who also didn't do it for whatever reason and asked for more time, she blew up on him. Another time that creeped me out was after I came back from when I was sick and out of school for a few days, she told me that she was really glad that I was back, rubbing my shoulders with both hands before she dragged one hand down my back slowly and left to continue the class. My best friend also saw this, and heard her too. We both agreed that it was an uncomfortable situation. I would like to say I was the youngest of my class, being at age 12, because my school at the time allowed kids to start class early. I'm now 19 years old, and this is probably the most I went public with this. My parents did find out about it three years ago, after I had a panic attack in high school, because I saw someone who looked similar to her and was taken to a hospital. Legal actions were taken, but nothing came from it. Sounds like a lot of stuff was waiting to happen, but never did. I think this person benefited from not being completely alone. He had his friend with whom he could sound things off of. And again, another situation that the movies really want to paint in a totally different light. It's sad that nothing happened when they took legal action, though. Story 4 
I actually have two stories, one from high school and one more current. In high school, I often kept to myself. This was because by this point, I had learned that not everyone at school had your best interest or even cares about you. Well, when I was walking between classes my senior or junior year, sometime after lunch, just trying to get to my next stop, I was deep in my phone when the next thing I knew, I felt a hand touch my hair. I looked back to see this girl I had never talked to in my entire life being there, even if I had seen her once or twice. Bewildered as all hell, I was just like, what the hell, why you go and do that? Her excuse? Sorry, your hair just looks so soft. Still to this day, I have no clue what her deal was. But my thought process was maybe someone sent her to harass me or something. As for the more recent creepy woman, it's a co-worker I have. Admittedly, I know more about this chick's personal life than I could ever care to learn, mostly because she brings her personal affairs to work, so to speak. She has no tact, an abrasive personality, and a voice to match, as well as an incel complex. And I don't use that term lightly, because she's looked me dead in my eye and said, Yeah, all the guys I try to date are either taken or gay. Doesn't take a psychic to see why. She has no personal boundaries, constantly yells, gets belligerent over trivial matters, and even expects everyone to be at her beck and call at all times. All of this, and she can't even be fired because she got her hand amputated after causing our co-worker she would go drinking with to swerve off the road with her hand out of the window. Women, what's something important you think men really don't understand about being a woman? Story 1. Intercourse. Birth control specifically. A lot of girls get on birth control because they want to have intimacy without getting pregnant. Birth control mucks up your body sometimes. I was on it for 10 years and for a while I had to deal with weight gain, bloating, acne, edema, irregular periods, and dryness in my vagina, which made intimacy painful unless I had lube. And that's not even close to all of it. By the way, if a girl suggests lube, don't take that as an offense. My boyfriend never lubed me up enough, even if I was turned on. Guys don't even acknowledge the struggle birth control side effects can have on a woman. Not to mention the health effects, money, birth control can be very expensive. Much more than condoms and other male birth control. And time. Taking it every day at the exact same time that it requires to be on it. All they see is intercourse without a condom. Yay, I don't need to buy them anymore. Guys can just slap a half-old damaged condom in their wallet and call it a day. Of course, the women chose to be on it because, and sometimes it's for other dilemmas, but the fact that guys will never have to go through this, and the fact that they will be able to get more pleasure out of the woman's expense is something they won't ever understand. God, this annoys me to no end. I hooked up with a guy once a couple years ago, but we didn't have intercourse because he didn't have a condom. Later, he asked me why I wasn't on birth control. I was flabbergasted, like, oh, I don't know. One, I don't want to take it because of the side effects. Two, I wasn't seeing anyone prior to this encounter, so pregnancy was never an issue. And three, take off and carry condoms because you're just as responsible, you jerk. I didn't go out with him again. I stopped taking it because of the effects it took on my body. Many girls I know don't take it because of the side effects. Guys usually don't like condoms because they can't feel as much. But I'd rather they use a damn condom that's in good condition instead of me losing hair and being moody 24-7. Not to mention the amount of money I'd save. Half the guys can't even find the actual man in the boat, and when I tell them, their egos get hurt. I feel like a woman's pleasure should be equal to theirs when having intercourse, not one above the other. And frankly, intercourse is usually in favor of the guy in my situations. I've only had a small awareness of what girls have to go through versus guys. I don't think I'd ever complain about having to use a condom. I know every once in a while they try to have some sort of pill or birth control shot for men. It seems like as soon as any side effects happen, then things just shut down and guys just opt not to do it. I don't really think that's fair. Story 2. 
the non-stop mental energy we devote to maintaining our safety in public, at work, in every interaction we have with a man we don't know well, and sadly, sometimes also with men we do know well, in our homes, in our cars, on the internet, it doesn't ever stop. I'm not saying I live my life in fear. It's so ingrained that I wouldn't even personally call it a burden, but it's certainly additional mental red tape. Every single decision or circumstance needs to be evaluated, often instantaneously. Not the person you're replying to, but a 24-year-old woman who can chime in with one of the things I personally think is pretty helpful. It may not be universal, but you probably won't offend or intimidate anyone with this. If you're introducing yourself to a woman in public, the least threatening way is to introduce yourself and then give her an out. If you're at a bar, approach her and say, Hey, I'm so-and-so. I think you're really cute. Insert compliment of your choice here. I'll be over there for a while if you want to talk. Basically, introduce yourself, state your intention, and go away. It puts no pressure on her if she's not interested, but opens a clear opportunity if she is. If it's not a romantic or intimate attraction, you can use the same formula and tailor it to whatever is appropriate. Personally, any time a guy has introduced himself in public and left right away, giving me the option for follow-up, it feels much more comfortable than a guy who's just going to hang around. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Hanging around is always the part I feel most uncertain about also. I see how maybe it's not universal, but I think it's a really good way to let someone have a choice. Thanks for responding. I never thought of this before. Very smart suggestion, and not just for the security or safety reasons outlined. Lifeline for all those nervous males out there without malevolent intent who are too shy to say hello. You know who you are. I also think this has a benefit for the guy as well. If he introduces himself and then just goes away, if she doesn't come back over and reciprocate, it's not as traumatic as getting rejected right to your face in public. It does kind of put things on equal ground. The guy has reached out and stated his intention. Now it's the girl's turn to reach out and state her intention. Fair's fair. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 3. How often we're silenced, shut down, or just never taken seriously. Whenever we seek medical attention, we're told it's just our cycle and get sent home with Midol. Whenever we speak up in the workplace, we're told we're being too shrewy. Whenever we try to seek justice for being assaulted, our characters get eviscerated in court. Even here online, users will flock in droves to scream, Not all men! If a woman opens up about being assaulted by a man, all to deliberately divert the conversation away from very real issues that women across the world have to deal with. If I had a dollar for every time I've been told to calm down when I'm right and frustrated that no one is taking what I'm saying seriously, or don't interrupt me when I'm talking, well, if you would just take a breath and let me speak, I could clear the whole thing up and end this miserable interaction in about five words. I love the men in my life right now. They're amazing people. But the not taking a woman seriously thing still happens, and they're completely unaware of it. Even playing games, they're overwhelmingly less likely to take my advice on a task. I can call out a way to solve a puzzle or give an answer at trivia, and they almost flat out ignore the suggestion. Unless another guy calls out the exact same thing, or they spend five minutes trying to solve it, then stumble upon the same thing I said after 15 attempts. If I say, yeah, I said that, I sometimes get that I'm being sensitive for even saying I knew. Like, guys, what the hell? If five plus people are ignoring you when you know you have a decent suggestion, it's annoying. And acknowledging I knew doesn't make me defensive. I'm trying to let you know that even with a vagina, I still have a functioning brain. I wonder how many women are now trying to find women doctors. They're probably hoping to have some sort of sympathy for their plight because the woman would know what they're going through. Was it ever likely that the woman doctor would treat them the same as the male doctor? I kind of think it would be very hard to find someone that would do that. Story 4 that the threat of being physically overpowered feels very real. Not just in the context of being physically assaulted, but in general. 
the lingering feeling that if this dude really wanted to, he could unalive me with his bare hands. I guess this could be gender nonspecific, but being generally on edge and female doesn't help with the sizing people up in case they try to lunge at me or something issue. Just being smaller than anyone sort of puts me on edge, and I've heard from other women they have similar thoughts. I encourage every woman to try Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's not a miracle pill that would make you invincible, but in my opinion, it's the only martial art that gives the smaller, weaker person a real shot at not just surviving a violent attack, but subduing their attacker. I've been training for around two years and have gotten my butt kicked by women plenty of times. I've also seen a lot of beginner men with fragile egos quit because they've gotten choked out by a woman smaller than them. I'm a purple belt, and honestly, I can say that the fear of being overpowered is still there. If anything, it's more real now than it was before. I've been injured so, so many times by spazzy white belt guys who just straight up don't understand that they can easily break something with their flailing. I know that despite all my years of training, all of the sparring, all of the competitions, in my featherweight and in absolutes, a big enough dude could easily hurt me anyway. Sure, I have a much better shot now than I did before, but that fear doesn't go away. Although I do enjoy crushing the occasional ego, and I'd like to encourage men to do better. Employers, what's the most insane complaint you've had about an employee that turned out to be completely true? Story 1. So I worked retail, and we got this guy named something like Gus. My boss tells me, hey, this guy's got anxiety. Go easy on him, okay? And so I was like, okay, that's cool. I get it. I can relate. I do everything I can to help him make sense of the infernal, godforsaken hellscape that is retail. It starts off with little forgivable things. Forgetting a task here, forgetting things there, accidentally giving the wrong info, and things like that. You know, newbie retail stuff like that. He quickly devolved in popularity as his complacency grew over time and his helpful attitude shrank. My guy started messing around during his shift, getting caught on his phone while ignoring backup cashier calls and things like that. He would make stabbing motions behind the manager's back to other employees, tell off new employees, and play it all off like he was some innocent dope who didn't know any better. None of this got him fired. Day after day was a new complaint from an employee about responsibilities he shirked or a customer about blatantly wrong info, like, oh yeah, we have another location up on the hill, and we didn't. No idea whose son he was, because that was apparently all kosher. What actually got him fired is the one day he brought a dog and a super expensive dog collar into work. He claimed he almost hit the dog on the way to work and it was running around wild, etc., etc. He tried to sell the dog collar to a customer, then tried to adopt out the dog to a co-worker. This co-worker was competent enough to take the dog to a vet, whereupon they found a microchip and contacted the actual owners. That's where the fun started. It came out that Gus never found the dog at all. He straight up kidnapped this dog from his neighbor and tried to pawn it off knowing full well what he was doing. The guy lawyered up immediately tried to sue Gus and threatened to sue the store and the store manager if Gus wasn't fired. Suffice to say, Gus was gone that very same evening. Nothing else came of it, but we talked about him for years and years. This is probably one of the better workplace stories I've heard in a while. How in the world did this guy last as long as he did? Did he have some kind of beef, real or imagined, with his neighbor? I tend to think if he was willing to kidnap his neighbor's dog and try to get rid of him to somebody else, he probably did some other shady things to try and stay in his job. He must have really been impressive in the interview to land this job. Story 2. Too long didn't read? Admin assistant committed fraud, resulting in her boss and eventually her being fired because her dog had a nervous condition. My boss lost an internal power struggle and was soon fired. The official reason given was he was submitting fraudulent expense reports. I'm not promoted, 
but given all of his responsibilities and I inherited his administrative assistant. Suddenly, charges for car service, local hotels, and local liquor stores appear on my corporate credit card. I ask the admin about the charges, and she gives me an explanation that's plausible, but that I know isn't accurate. I called the credit card company and contest the charges until they provide more info. I also started doing some of my own research on the charges. Turns out the admin assistant was an alcoholic who lived with her dog in the local hotel I was getting charged for. She was having the car service pick up her booze at the local liquor store and deliver it to her at the hotel. Why? Her dog had a nervous condition and he liked that hotel. He would get upset if she went out to the store after she got back from work, so she used the car service so she wouldn't leave and upset the dog. She charged the expenses to my bosses and my corporate cards because we owed her for making her come to work and leave her dog alone. I got her fired and successfully fought the credit card charges. Even though I found the person actually committing the fraud, my boss was still considered fired for cause because he signed the expense reports with the fraudulent charges. To be fair, it does sound like he was lousy at his job. And we have another one where a dog is involved. But also, dig the massive privilege exhibited by this admin assistant. There's taking care of your dog, and there's forming an unhealthy relationship with your dog. She actually justifies her alcoholism by basically stating the dog made me do it. That's some son of Sam logic right there. Story 3. We had this guy as a delivery driver. Super nice, quiet, never showed any signs of anger, even in stressful situations. We started getting calls mainly from older women that our delivery driver, we had our logo on both front doors, was cutting off, flipping off, yelling runt at these women. I didn't believe it at first. I thought maybe they cut him off, he honked, they wanted him fired, so made up some big story. Then, the back window got busted out of the vehicle, and then the radio looked like it got punched out for whatever reason. Everything came together, and we found out he had huge anger issues. He stopped showing up, so it solved itself, but it was crazy how good of a front he put on. There are two kinds of anger in people. The first, most common one, is the casual anger. Your reaction to a stressor is immediate. Someone cuts you off, you shout, get it out of your system. The second kind is the explosive anger. Someone cuts you off, you remain calm on the outside, bottle it inside. But when multiple stressors happen in short succession, you blow the hell up and escalate it. Sounds like the guy was the second type and old ladies driving slowly were too much to handle for him. The good old anger spiral. Something makes you angry. Little things that just kind of pile up throughout the day make you more angry. Your general grumpiness makes people mad at you, and that stuff won't stop until you eventually just go to bed. I agree, he must have landed this interview well. Was there no other indications from any previous jobs? Were any of the other jobs... Customer facing? Maybe he just did office work up to this point and didn't have to deal with driving very much. Story 4. Happened recently. Driving job. I don't really have to worry about the person recognizing this. He sucked so bad with computers that I nearly ended up with a manslaughter charge during onboarding. Okay, I get this person through onboarding. My boss in HR get him through orientation. We set him out to train. Trainer comes in exasperated. Dude can't drive. The easy part of the job. He can't secure cargo. The more challenging but still easy part of the job. He starts crying while driving. He ignores instruction. This goes on for a week. Trainer says he's not going to pass the guy. I tell my boss his options are to either have him retrain under another trainer, do a ride along, draw his own conclusions, or term the guy. Eventually, my boss does the ride-along. The guy nearly causes a wreck while doing exactly what he was told not to do with me in front of him not three minutes ago. During his ride-along, he runs two stop signs and nearly has a head-on collision. 
Boss wanted to give him another week as long as he didn't mess up his paperwork. This is my domain, and I've been known to make people reconstruct their entire day from scratch if they mess it up bad enough. He proceeds to back out of the lot with both hands off the wheel. Yeah, that's it. Boss wanted to give him another week? What the hell is wrong with your boss? Sunk costs are a horrible thing. Story 5. Had a new hire, as in less than a week on the job at a movie theater where I worked as a supervisor, threw a very loud, unbelievably childish tantrum in front of a lobby full of customers because her direct supervisor asked her to sweep up some popcorn that a customer spilled. She kept screaming, I ain't cleaning up someone else's mess. Make them, the customer, do it. She was 24 years old. The meltdown she had when she got fired for her tantrum was nuclear, with lots of screaming and threats of how her parents were going to call the company and get all your butts fired. The next day, someone claiming to be her dad did call and tell us that we are going to rehire my daughter and apologize to her and fire, named her supervisor and manager, or else. But nothing more came of it. The top manager just laughed and hung up. I've yet to ever see such an epic entitled tantrum before or since. You just reminded me of a guy that I briefly worked with last year, if only for the fact that when he quit, he was threatening to sue. Had a lawyer call the next day, but my boss completely blew it off because he knew it was the guy's girlfriend and then never heard from him again. Did your high school have an incident? What was it? Story 1. I need to preface this with two things. A. Drinking is legal in Germany from the age of 16. B. After elementary school, age 6 to 10, we have a three-tier school system of main school, lowest school, real school, gymnasium, highest level, instant university access. And all three schools had separate buildings where I live, but were all basically next to each other. So it was customary at our school from about the 11th, gymnasium only, other two schools finish after 10th grade, grade onwards, we have 13 grades, to join the end of school year camping where you go camping in a field next to the school and basically just get wasted and go to school hungover the next day. That year it was raining heavily, so we drank outside the real gymnasium, as in where P.E. takes place, because we stayed dry there. Gradually, people left as the night progressed. We left about 3 a.m., I believe, and went to school pretty hungover the next day, which was the last day of school. Well, at around 9.30 a.m., we hear the principal making an announcement via the speaker system, which went a bit like this. Dear pupils and staff, all festivities today are canceled because, and there is no other way to put it, somebody pooped on the door of the main school. All pupils who attended the camping last night are to report to the principal's office. After about three seconds of absolutely stunned silence, the whole school exploded with laughter. Too long didn't read? Someone took a dump in front of the school door before the last day of school. It's not exactly Martin Luther nailing the Reformation on the Wittenberg door, is it? Most kids just toss all their homework up in the air before they leave. Hopefully this wasn't part of an assignment. Also, getting drunk on school grounds. It's kind of like the mom that says, if you're going to get drunk, do it in the basement so I know you're safe. Story 2. In my sophomore year, some freshmen bought some stink bombs online from Japan so vile that they could be biological weapons. Just one of these things could make an entire gymnasium full of doe-eyed children turn into savage unalivers just to escape the stench. But that was not enough for this young boy's insatiable thirst for chaos. No, he broke five in one stairwell. What happened could only be described as a war crime. The use of toxins was outlawed in World War I for times like this. It was strong enough to crawl right up your nose and rip your sanity out through your nostril like the extraction of the brain of a mummy in ancient Egypt. The smell was so rancid that the administration thought every sewage line in the entire school had ruptured, causing them to shell out $10,000 in repairs for a problem that simply could not be fixed. Despite all this, school continued as usual. 
Despite the fact that walking by the stairwell was like taking a deep inhale of the aroma of every communal outhouse in the slums of Mumbai, it was the best of times and the worst of times. The smell still haunts me to this day. Edit. Thanks for all the support and good comments on my writing style. To be honest, I was pretty drunk when I wrote this, but everything I said is true. The stench has burned into my senses forever. Edit part two. <laughs> so it's the story about the guy who tear-gassed the school with liquid poop that gets me gold. This must have been a really enclosed school. Schools that I went to would have probably had the doors open all day. Most of them just led outside. This was before a lot of the uh, gun violence has been going on, so that probably has changed. But yeah, the school I was at would have probably aired out for about two or three days. Story 3. The music teacher had an infamous habit of putting on a video about Mozart or some other music bod, and then vanishing into his study for the remainder of the lesson. He would emerge smiling, slurring his words slightly, and smelling strongly of sherry by the third lesson of the day. In an act subsequently recognized,